Hey everyone, uh, John and Matt here again doing our second podcast. I know it's been a sec, but as always, we're really excited to be here. So for those who don't know, we're the creators of Story Prism, which are AI writing tools that simulates collaboration with a co-writer. If you're interested in checking that out, we got a link in the show notes. But today we have a very special guest and a dear friend of ours, Wes Thronberry, the founder of Baltimore Charm City Filmmakers, which uh, arguably is the biggest film collective in the city. Um, so we got a link for them in the show, uh, to them in the show notes as well. So you can check them out and see all their great work, but yeah, man, Wes, thank you so much for coming on. Glad to be able to help out. Yeah, man. Um, so I guess just like right off the bat, um, how big is this film collective exactly? Um, I mean, like how many films would you say the group produced this year alone? Well, um, okay, so there's the group itself in, ter in terms of all the members and then the actual people in involved in an each, uh, actual production wave. Uh, the current production wave has got 15 films. The collective itself has probably close to about 90 members, I'd say. Jeez. Wow. Man, that's, that's exciting. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, I remember when we first started there back in like 2016, it was like, how many people 10 people <laughs> something like that right? it was like 10 people and then like maybe four or five people would show up at a meeting or whatever and yeah it was just like we didn't even have any kind of direction or anything it was just like hey let's just talk about film and if somebody has a film we want to work on let's let's do it you know what i mean um but yeah i mean that's that's a lot of films for a volunteer group like making no budget films um and that's great because uh i can't honestly think of anybody i personally know that's more qualified to talk about uh the topic that we're trying to cover today which is getting started in indie filmmaking when you have no experience no expertise or anything to start with uh so yeah i mean i guess let's just begin uh, at ground zero here um a little bit of background like who you are how you got into filmmaking and really just sort of what was that journey that led you to create the baltimore charm city filmmakers okay all right uh well uh, i started originally uh with an improv group uh that improv group evolved into making um, stage theater sketch shows and that evolved into making short films, uh, mob television, which I was involved with for about 15 years. Um, and then uh, there was actually someone else who was already running uh, Charm City Filmmakers. They were not at the time uh, doing much with it. So I took over the group um, and the central tenant of the group ever since then has been to help enable people to make films. Um, one of the hardest things, as you sort of touched on earlier, uh, is that it's very hard to get involved in independent film, especially by yourself. Uh, most independent film groups that I know are groups that are, you know, a small group of people get together and they make, you know, they make just that one person's films that are, or that small collective group's films. So unless you're willing to sort of start your own group, there aren't many options. Term City is all about putting together a group of volunteers that can help you make your film. That's cool. Yeah. What like so? What uh, did this kind of start almost for selfish reasons, like for yourself? Were you just like, hey, I want to actually get into filmmaking. I want to personally learn how to make films. But like as you pointed out, there's like you know, <laughs> there's all these close knit groups that are very hard to get into. So you know. I mean, screw it. I'm just going to go ahead and make my own or I'm just going to go ahead and take this on and just invite a bunch of filmmakers. And hopefully I don't know what's going to happen out of this, but we'll see what happens. Is that kind of how it started? Well, I will say that I took over Charm City filmmakers specifically because I wanted to get back on set. You know, I didn't necessarily want to be making my films exactly, but I just wanted to be making any films, honestly. And. And um, so I reached out to the who they were interested in, and um, we actually did, in fact, make a few films in the very beginning. The only real downside to that was is that um, we didn't really know what we were doing, and so we had to hire a lot of our production, and we were making these films that were, relatively speaking, very, very expensive, and so it just wasn't sustainable, you know. Um, once we tapped out the number of people in the group who were willing to shell out five or $6,000 to make a film, we pretty much ran through the group really fast that way. 
So the evolution towards making a film involved a full volunteer group, both in terms of, you know, for the full production, cast and crew, everybody volunteering, everything being really cheap, um, was not an original idea. It didn't start that way. But it evolved to that quickly, pretty quickly because, well, frankly, because it let us make more films, you know? What about your own uh, uh, experience kind of like as you know, personal? Like what drove you to become a filmmaker? Why, why did you get started in this? Charm City or originally a in filmmaker general, in the first place? In general. Just um, like as a filmmaker. Well, like I said, it was sort of accidental, if I can be honest. Uh, we were making, uh, we were doing stage theater back in the day. And the, the problem with theater is that it wasn't being recorded. It wasn't being saved. Um, and so the idea was that moving into film let us take our stories and share them in a way that we couldn't. And honestly, once that got started, once I got to see how, I don't want to make it sound like it's super easy, but a lot of the elements of putting together a uh, theater play and a film are very, very similar. And so once we sort of understood how relatively straightforward film could be, uh, that anyone could pick up a camera, that anyone could um, come up with an idea and then tell that story and then share that story with, you know, unlimited people, especially online, uh, it really, I, it was hard to imagine doing anything else, if I could be honest. Yeah, that's a, that's kind of a tricky thing to even answer. You know, even for us, like, why did we even get into films? I, I honestly, I don't really know. I just, I love it so much. And I think I loved it even more when I found out how doable it was, because it just seemed like such an impossible feat. Um, probably like, I mean, I guess we first started back in high school, but even then it was just goofing around. And we know, we knew we couldn't make like, you know, some high quality stuff that, especially the stuff that you see in Charm City. So it's like, that was, you know, I think that kind of illuminated for us, like in 2012, when we were just like, you know what, we're just so down and out right now with like our jobs and everything. Let's just, let's just make a movie. And it was really just for therapeutic purposes, I guess, initially. But I don't know. Yeah, it's it interesting. Um, so I guess, uh, I guess for like first time filmmakers, you work with a lot of them, of course. Um, like, what would you say is like kind of like the more common mistakes that you see from them and maybe some of the mistakes that you personally made yourself just starting out? You know, um, I think for a lot of people in the beginning, um, it's a hard to get an idea of sort of the scale involved. Um, for most people, a lot of first time directors I work with they want to start very, very big. You know, let's let's do a feature length film. I'm ready. I can't wait. Uh, and they have no idea how involved that would be. Um, and, you know, for them, making a film, whether it's a single day or a feature length film, feels like all sort of like the same amount of work. Either it's too impossible uh, and they don't see, realize that it can be done or it is super easy and why not do a feature length film? Because that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, very few people come to the group with a proper appreciation of what's going to be involved. Um, now, I like working with both types of filmmakers. I like working with filmmakers and going, no, no, this is possible. You can make a film. Um, and then for others, going, well, okay, the mechanics, the um, the skills necessary to make a film can be applied to both the feature length scale and to the short scale, start with a short length film, understand what's involved there, and then build that up to something bigger. Um, so either way, it's a matter of just sort of getting people to understand what's actually involved, how actually engaging and difficult it is to make a film in the first place. You work with a lot of, of people coming to Charm City. Would you say most of them are, are identify themselves as writers or most of them want to see themselves as filmmakers mostly? Or is it kind of like a mix? Well, okay. So let me just say, first and foremost, that the way that Charm City just generally works is that absolutely anyone can come in, write a script, and make a film. Um, and so 
that basically means that everybody who ends up making a film with Charm City ends up doing the dual role of both writer and ultimately director, and in most cases, editor as well. So regardless of what they want, they end up getting pressed into doing both. Now, having said that, yes, it's absolutely the case that a lot of them have a writing background and their interest is much more about the writing of making of a film and others are not that concerned about writing at all and they're much more concerned about like directing the film kind of thing um i would say yeah, what i have found is that most directors most filmmakers um, are definitely influenced by their background so we have people who come into the group who came in as an actor uh, and they ended up becoming a writer director and you can tell that they had that acting background other people who come in as pure writers they've never done any of that sort of directing stuff and then that is influenced they have a lot more focus on like say the script for example um but yes absolutely get people come in who just want to make films who want to be directors uh, and that influences the kind of stories they tell so um we definitely get a healthy mix of both I, I don't know if I can tell you if it was exactly 50-50, but yeah, there are a lot of people who come at, most people who come into filmmaking come at it from a very, very particular perspective. And for most people, that is either as a writer background or more as an actor director background. You really kind of stress, uh, you know, volunteers and having people kind of do different roles that they may not be comfortable with, having people do sound, maybe they're not sound people, but learning it and, you know, you're trying to get more into getting people to be more DPs. So like, what is that in your perspective, like, like being an all arounder, especially as an indie filmmaker, like why, why do you think that's important? Especially when it comes to like directors should know how to edit, um, um, even write, right? I mean, they should know, understand the process. Would you say that's kind of accurate? Like they should know everything about making a movie as much as possible? Well, so, let me let me let me let me take that as in as sort of two different two different bits. So first, I would definitely say that um, if your goal is to become a great director, a great filmmaker, um, one of the best ways to do that, the best way to do that in my mind, is to take on all these various roles. Um, we don't absolutely require it, but it is generally the case that everyone who writes and directs uh, a film also ends up having to edit that film. Uh, I find that to be incredibly educational because it's not really until you're in the editing booth and you know picking together the pieces of your film that you really understand all the specifics of um, how to put together a scene, what's required to put that in, um, you know, what kind of transitions you need. Um, it's something. It, it's when you get to see, frankly, all the mistakes that you've made. And as an editor, as you're fixing them, um, that definitely influences your work as a director and certainly comes into play the next time um, that you become a filmmaker. The next time you make a film, you're like, oh, right, I remember I have to do this. And I think beyond that, being a cinematographer, being a sound engineer, being grip, first AD, being in front of the camera, being one of the actors, all of this will enhance um, your knowledge of what it takes to make a film, which ultimately will enhance your knowledge to be a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Now, the second part of that is a much more practical part of that. Uh, when I was in mob television before Term City, there were like five or six of us and there was no one else. So you had to take on the hand of the camera and you had to hold the boom pole for a while because there just wasn't anyone else doing it. So I think that taking on various roles is incredibly helpful, just purely educationally in terms of making you a better filmmaker but in a very practical sense, as an independent filmmaker, it's kind of required. It's sort of, you have to. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, uh, like, on, honestly, just from my perspective, like, any of the roles are pretty doable, like, in terms of learning. Um, I think it's because, like, most of those roles are just very physical. You know, it's like, hey, you, you need to make sure, like, you're holding the camera this way or that way, and this is how you light properly, and yada, yada, yada. But I think the one uh, biggest challenge for me personally is editing. So like, how hard is that for somebody who's just like, hey, I have all these shots and no, I can't pay anybody to edit it. I have to do it myself. This is going to take like five years. Well, okay. So 
obviously, of course, again, um, this is one of those cases where uh, editing for a short film is similar, at least in terms of what you're doing in terms of the skill set as editing a feature length. So one of the nice things about having a single short film, something that's like, you know, eight, nine minutes long as your first film, it is easier to edit in the sense that it's just physically much, much shorter. Um, there is, of course, support and help within the group. People, since most of the filmmakers in the group have edited their own films, that means most of the people in the group have editing experience. And the group does offer a lot of support for people as they're first learning to edit. Um, having said that, it's not necessarily as daunting as you might think. Um, again, most of the shorts, the first films people make are very short. There's not that many scenes, not that many uh, multiple takes. So putting together a sort of a simple edit is not necessarily as challenging as possible as, as you might think. And there is also support for some of the more advanced editing techniques, color correction, um, uh, sound, sound design, smoothing out, that sort of thing. So I won't say that it's easy. Uh, and most, <laughs> most directors I know hate editing, <laughs> absolutely hate it. But as I said before, I really, really believe it's a critical part of becoming a better filmmaker. You know, I said earlier that um, you can always kind of tell where that editor, where that person came from as a filmmaker, as an actor or writer or whatever. Uh, some of the most natural directors I know started out as editors first. And you can see as they're filming, they're editing in their mind. They're putting the scene together. They're compositing the shot as they're filming it. And that gives them tremendous insight into exactly how to craft that shot. Um, I would argue that you really, really can't properly be a filmmaker unless you know how to edit a film, because that is the actual, actual mechanical process of assembling the film. Yeah, yeah. I think I heard it said uh, that editing is actually the only art that's unique to filmmaking. Uh, you know, photography, obviously, cinematography. all those are somewhere else, but yeah, no, exactly. Editing is, editing, yeah, it's the only thing that's well, because it, it, I guess it's because it, like, as you said, it just helps you design those shots because a lot of people come into it, and this is what I came into it thinking was like, oh, you shoot to the edit, right? So it's just you're getting shot one, and then you're getting that close up, and then you're going back to that other wide shot and stuff. And not only does that like mess you up logistically on time because just moving that stuff can take a long time to do but it's just, you're gonna mess yourself up in the editing room. One of the things I really try to push for people in the group to both write and direct is because I believe those are both key elements in the narrative process. Writing is the first attempt to sit down and say, this is the story I wanna tell. And then you sort of take the writer hat off, you put the director hat on and you go, okay, now how do I show this? How do I, how do I, how do I get these, across, across, these ideas across on film? And then the final phase of the narrative process is the editor. A really good editor will go in and then take things out, add things, move things around in such a way that it's a story that is not the same as what the director or the writer had in mind because there's been more added uh, to the narrative story through the editing process. It's an absolutely critical part of the process. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Um, so let's just back up for a second. So, like, I'm. So I'm a nervous writer and you managed to convince me to climb over that mountain and make a film. Um, so I'm ready to do it. So I guess what is that very first process like uh, for you guys in Charm City? Like, what do you do with these first time filmmakers? Like, you know, from day one to, I guess, maybe even just the halfway point. Well, <clears throat> So they, you know, someone starts with a script. Uh, first, of course, is to make sure the script is reasonable. Um, for Term City in particular, I will say that the only major logistical requirement we have is that it's something that can be filmed in a single day. So assuming the script is simple enough and short enough that it can be filled in a single shooting day. <sighs> but then they bring the scripts to the group. We give them a lot of feedback on what works and what doesn't, though, and this has really always been very, very important to me, uh, it is their story. You know, if they want it to go a particular way, if they want it to be told a particular way, then I'm, you know, I'm always going to be whatever they want. At the end of the day, 
Charm City is about helping people tell their stories. And so I'm not here to tell you how to tell your story. I'm certainly going to give advice, suggestions. The group will do that too. But ultimately, exactly how it's told, that's always up to the director. Uh, so after that script is submitted, after that works, then we start moving through the pre-production, start talking about props that have to be acquired, locations that have to be used, uh, uh, roles that they'll need to fill, which then leads us into a casting process. Um, one of the nice things about doing all doing a whole bunch of films at once, and the 15 films I mentioned earlier are all essentially being shot at this, during the same production cycle, is that we can do a much larger casting audition process to bring in a whole bunch of actors. You know, normally if you're just casting for a single film with like say three or four roles, you're only going to get a few dozen actors to come in for the auditions. But with us, you know, casting for like 15 films, each with a few roles each, you end up with hundreds of actors in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. Uh, so the actors then, I'm sorry, excuse me, the directors then go, you know, go, uh, pick the actors from the auditioning process. They secure their locations, props. We have a we have locations within the group that we help them with. And then it's on to production. Hmm, hmm, that's cool. So I guess what would be the most challenging part then during that first step for a new person? I guess the thing that you it, see it, that does to an extent, I will say that it does vary from person to person though usually the hardest thing i think in the beginning there is just kind of breaking their story down in terms of in terms of the pre-production you know working out the list working out the logistics of it um a lot of people when they think about directing they think about you know they think about that guy on set who's like yelling action and cut and that is a very big part of directing absolutely but it also is there's a big part of being a director that's project manager. You know what I mean? Uh, assembling your team, uh, picking a production date, getting a location, getting all these pieces in place. Um, one of the downsides, maybe the worst, maybe, maybe, one of the worst things about being an independent filmmaker is there isn't a lot of help in terms of pre-production. You know, I certainly there are people within the group that people can lean on, but in terms of a lot of that pre-production stuff, location scouting, casting, uh, prop acquisition, prop construction, set design, all of that sort of falls under the director. There's, there's support for it, but nevertheless, it's a lot of work, especially for a lot of people that haven't really been thinking in terms of those things. You know what I mean? They're like, oh no, I wrote it, I'm ready to shoot. It's like, yeah, but you now have to like actually put together the elements, the components to make that shoot happen. And so I think for a lot of people, that is easily the biggest culture shock. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, for sure. It, it was extremely daunting for us to do it. Like just having, you know, we even gave ourselves like six months yeah. to plan a short, which a lot of people in the group have done in like two weeks or like three yeah. weeks or a month or two. And it's, it's really amazing that uh, they're able to handle that kind of pressure because even six months out is, I mean, that's just, there's so much that you have to juggle with, like figuring out, I mean, just the simple things like figuring out where to buy your stuff, you know, and if you have wardrobe, right. And somebody, you know, you have a scene where somebody throws up on somebody. Okay. Well, maybe you need to get like three different, uh, you know, pairs of the same exact wardrobe and maybe mm -hmm. you don't want to make it a complicated dress or something mm -hmm. that's going to cost like a hundred dollars. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, I guess like for me, the the probably the hardest would be the pre-visualization. So this is where I lean on John because um, he's amazing at doing that. And I just sort of like I'm like, you know, the guy who kind of helps and holds the flashlight and whatnot in that regards. But I guess for somebody who doesn't have somebody like John as a partner, like how do they go about pre-visualizing? How would you kind of advise them to do that? Well, OK, so. Another element of being a director besides project manager is, you know, you are the keeper of the vision. You know, the idea is that you have different and different directors. Some directors are much more writer directors, so they don't have much visuals at all. They just have this thing that they've written. Other people have the entire thing mapped out in their head. The, the point is that as the director, it is your job to not only come up with the vision, what this is actually literally going to look like, 
but then communicating that vision to everybody who who needs to know that vision. So for example, um, if you want to, you know, if your bill, if your, if your piece has an unusual location and that it needs to be designed, a set design, then you need to get across either to yourself or to the person who's going to help you build this, what it's going to look like. Um, I, I, I will say that personally, I'm a big fan of storyboards, but I know that that doesn't work for all directors. And one of the things I have learned over the years with working various directors is that a lot of directors visualize in completely different ways. So for me, in the beginning, when I'm working with a first time director, it's a matter of figuring out exactly what is going to what pre is going to work for them. You know, for some, it's more of a mood board sort of thing. Um, other people like to do like a sizzle reel sort of idea. Uh, as long as the person can find a way to communicate to their crew and to their cast exactly what they want to look like, then I'm fine with whatever, whatever their pre method is. But yeah, I will say that it it absolutely varies wildly from director to director. Yeah. Now the key is to be as clear as possible mm -hmm. to uh, your collaborators. I, I would agree with that. I know Matt and I did a, when we did our one of our shorts with you guys. The uh, we actually had you <laughs> act <laughs> as one of the characters, and we just filmed you with you know the simple camera, and uh, we gave that to our DP, and he just he got it immediately, and he knew exactly what to do. So and it helped out, save saved a ton of time on our shoot, which was poor on time. We had to really move quickly. So yes, we did. Yeah, <laughs> the, the crew look the the volunteer crew that I put together. They're 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 there. They're, they're, they're not there for their vision. They're there for your vision. They're going to they're gonna be there 100%. But they can't do what you want if they don't know what you want them to do, you know? So if if they don't know the feeling, the mood, the, the, the idea you're trying to get across, then they're not going to be able to give it to you. So, yeah, exactly. Do you want... Do you want this to be a darkly lit scene? You know, part of that comes into the cinematography of it. Um, we did a film a, a, a couple of years ago where she just wanted everything to be done at Dutch angles. You know, she just wanted that sort of awe, you know, unnerving sort of feel. She got that across the cinematographer. Cinematographer was able to give her what she wanted. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I guess like, um, so if I'm somebody who's just super green and it's like, okay, I can, you know, visualize this by like maybe writing out like a shot list of some kind, but like, I guess in that case, I would probably want to have to lean on my uh, cinematographer a lot, maybe like meet up with them regularly if I can to just help them like, hey, so you know how to set up shots. So how do I translate this into something that works for your crew and you guys to be able to like do it? Um, would you say that's probably a good idea? Well, yes. Look, in general... Um, especially once you've gotten your cast locked into place and your crew locked into place, which happens right around the casting process, it's really important that you're meeting with your cast and crew ahead of time um, to make sure that you're getting that across. And so with the cinematographer in particular, uh, for example, at the very least, you want to be able to make sure that you meet with the cinematographer at the location, you know, once you've got a location secured so that you can walk through the space and talk about how it's lit and how you want to see it. Um, in terms of the cast, you're going to have multiple read-throughs where you'll sit down and discuss with the actors, okay, I want these lines to be delivered this way or that way. Um, if you are going to be designing a set, then you're going to need to meet with your set designer with sketches and pictures and photographs, that kind of thing. Um, obviously, it depends on exactly how complicated your production is, but even for the simplest of productions, you know, one room with like two or three actors interacting it's still going to be the case that you're going to want to meet with with the parts of your crew ahead of time to sit down clearly and discuss it. Um, another meeting, for example, will be you'll sit down with your first AD and you'll discuss the logistics of the shoot. You know, this is when this is going to start. This is when I need this to start. This is when I need this to kind of come in. So, yes, um, <laughs> one of the big parts of pre-production, frankly, is just a lot of meetings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. Because I mean, really like your main goal is, okay, so you have a day to shoot or even if like you're not part of the charm city and you're just like, Hey, I got a few days to shoot every single minute on set. It's just going to cost you money. Um, oh, yeah. especially if you're paying crew, uh, to be there. Uh, so like you, you kind of have to treat it like, Hey, we're planning the Royal wedding 
and it's happening on this day mm -hmm. and we cannot piss the queen off otherwise <laughs> they off with their heads you know what i mean um yeah so i mean but i guess i so i guess speaking of crew like what what is like the bare minimum crew that somebody would need if they're running on a budget well okay obviously um what is a bare crew depends very some situation to situation i will say that for term city films um i really at the very minimum director should have uh first ad uh director of photography sound engineer and it's often underappreciated but i'm a very big fan of script supervisor and then beyond that, um, personally, I would want at least one or two PAs, uh, production assistants. Yeah. So, like, for me, a skeleton, skeleton crew would be director, first AD, uh, director of photography, sound engineer, script supervisor, and then, like, say, two PAs. Gotcha. Well, so uh, PA, just for people who don't know, is a production assistant. And I guess an AD would be an assistant director. So like, what is their role? Because aren't you the director? <laughs> uh, so first assistant director is more than anything else, just to make sure is to make sure that your crew is running on time and smoothly. The first AD's job is to make sure that you're staying on schedule, that you are uh, getting to all the elements that you did that basically they run the production so the director doesn't have to make sure that everything is is running smoothly. Um, I will say that more than anything else, first AD is really about helping a production stay on time. Without a first AD, I've seen productions just run lo much longer than the director intended. Mm -hmm. So more than anything else, it's about just keeping everything tight. Gotcha. Uh, cinematographer and sound engineer, I think, are pretty obvious. Um, most people are very familiar with camera and sound. That's pretty clear. Um, but for the fourth one, script supervisor, um, that's really important for making sure that you're not missing anything. You know, one of the things about being a director is there's just so many things going on. It's very easy to forget something like, oh, right, this person was in this room and now they're in this room. We need to see something where they're coming down a flight of stairs or something along those lines. Uh, they're also basically there to make sure that there's good continuity. If the cup, if the if the last scene, the uh, character was holding a cup in their left hand, we want to make sure we transition the next thing that cup is still in the left hand. Um, I will say that for the first few waves, we did not have a script supervisor and all sorts of uh, errors and mistakes cropped up in post. And so that's why we added the script supervisor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then, of course, like a production assistant is just the helping hand. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily like have to have any like uh, hard skills in film, but they, you know, at the very least, you want them to be willing and able to like, you know, move stuff from point A to point B and just help out wherever it's needed. Yeah. And then the other role, the other groups like cinematographer will have his own crew. Yeah. You know, they'll have grips and which are lighting guys. And oh, yeah, we can scale up. I, yeah, mean, yeah, I would add that for a first yeah, yeah. I'd ask AC yeah, second yeah, yeah. absolutely absolutely and look look some of the some of our films especially you know I, I said that the first time directors they only get a single day but if you make another film with us you get two days and that ex can expand to more and certainly we've had productions where we've had 25 30 crew members uh depending on what the production is so it absolutely can scale up and look, I want to be honest, you can scale down. I don't want to, I always say that, you know, if you want to make a film, make a film, pick up a camera, grab a couple of your friends, run out of the woods, go film something. Uh, even the requirements that I had for those four people are not absolutely, absolutely required. It's just the more people you can have helping you, the better your film can be. Yeah. But if, if the only choice is you and a camera, then pick up a camera and go film something. Yeah, well, alternatively, I'll say too, though, uh, sometimes if you have too many people on your set for a production that just does not require it, or if the space is super tight, uh, that can actually be kind of detrimental, um, especially for your budget, because maybe it's like, hey, you know, we, we have like five or six people standing around and not really doing anything. And we have to give them lunch. Yeah, now we have to feed them all. <laughs> and it's like, and all this other stuff. cool, yeah. thanks for being our cheerleaders. <laughs> yeah. So, so that kind of leads into another question I had. So when, when you're working with first-time filmmakers and um, you mentioned um, you kind of have first-time filmmakers in the group are limited to one day and then two days for your next one as you, as you progress in advance. So... What is, why, why did you implement that? Is that, is, is like, what was your reasoning behind the, the one day rule? 
for uh, first time filmmakers? Um, because, well, okay. So I firmly believe that the best way to become a director is to learn, is to direct. Like, I think it's one of those things you just have to do and learn from that experience to become a better director. And the elements of learning how to become a good director can be made in a film that is four minutes long, just as easily as it could be in a film that is, you know, three hours long. The the basic core elements of being a director are going to be true for any of the for any length film. The idea being that a short film, a single day, um, will be something where they can really learn the specifics before they move on to more challenging projects. The thing I like to say, and most people do not like hearing this, but it's still true, is that in theory, hopefully your first film should be the worst film you've ever made because you every film after that should be better. Um, we're talking about mistakes that first time directors make. Some, some of the, one of the more heart wrenching ones is when people come to the group and they have this story that's incredibly important to them. You know, it's it's something that happened to them when they were young or something that they've been working on for years and they want to make it as their first film. And it's it's beautiful, but it's involved and complicated. And, you know, I'm always, I'm always trying very hard to talk them out of that being their first film because that first film is really much more of a learning exercise. No one starts out automatically knowing how to be a good director, though... Most people, a lot of people who join the group go, I've seen good films. I know what makes a good film. I can be a director. And they don't realize there's a lot more to it than just knowing what a good film looks like. And I would rather them cut their teeth, so to speak, on this on the simplest production possible, a single day shoot, learn that, and then apply that to more adventurous, more ambitious projects. Mm. Yeah, and the That's other smart. point too is like, not only is that smart, but it's also... I mean, just from like the, you know, I don't even want to say the, the model that you guys have for Charm City is voluntary based. So like maybe you can get an outside cinematographer sometimes or whatever that has more sets of skills and gear and you might have to fork out some money. But even then, a lot of times you're kind of giving them like, a, you know, small rate compared to what they usually charge. So it's just kind of out of respect, honestly. You don't want to burn out all these volunteers and give them a bad experience where it's like, oh my God, we've been working on this same film for like a month straight. I even had a weekend off and I'm, I'm not getting paid or I'm not getting anything from this and blah, 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 blah. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense to kind of limit people with that. But I guess, I mean, theoretically though, if somebody came in, somebody who was like really well off and they were like, I got $30,000 and I just want to make this film in a week. You know, if I could get somebody to pay, if I'll pay you guys and blah, blah, blah. Like, is that something that would be like, um, real else? you know, we, we did recently acquire a studio and that is now we're going to, we're turning our eyes towards doing feature length films. But to your point, you know, even if you are, if you do a very conservative feature length film, say uh, 10, 10 shooting days for a 90 page script, um, that still involves having a crew come there for 12 hour days for 10 days in a row. That's a lot more than just a favor on a weekend. And so, yeah, to your point, that would involve a lot more money. Um, I don't want to say we wouldn't, obviously with enough money, we would, and there'd be people who'd be more than interested in doing that sort of thing. But I certainly would feel a lot more comfortable um, if I knew the director had experience. The, the, the mistake is not, I, I, you know, honestly, it's not a matter of like, $30,000 is enough to make a film or not. Personally, for me, I'd be a lot more comfortable knowing that the person had directing experience. As I said, a lot of people who first come into the group, they want to make a feature right away. They don't even think shorts. They're just like, I'm ready to do a feature. Let's do a feature. And if they have never directed before ever, um, that just seems to me to be a recipe for disaster. So I'm like, okay, fine. You want to make a feature? That's great. Show, show me your directorial skills, make a couple of short films first. Let me see that experience. Let me see that, that knowledge that you're acquiring. And then we can talk about doing a feature. My advice to anyone who wants to make a feature length film is start by making a few shorts first. Yeah. And if they don't have the, the patience or the intent, interest in doing that, then I'm not sure it's someone I'm going to want to work with. Yeah, and yeah. it's also content too right? Content is content. Great content is great content. So even if you're making a five minute short or a 10 minute short, 
I mean, if you're a really good writer and you have a really good story, you know, that can, that alone can, you know, enough of that can certainly open up other opportunities for you to maybe even be able to get financing for that low budget feature or whatever that you really want to make. So it's also, yeah, it's, it's a much more optimal path than trying to climb that giant mountain. Yeah. We do have we do have people in the group who have like feature length ideas that they want to pursue and they take advantage of Charm City to make something like either a trailer or the first, you know, like a like the first scene of an idea. And the idea being that if they could sell that uh, scene, show that scene to people, get enthusiasm, get excitement, they could come back with a larger budget and turn it into a feature like film. I, I think that's a great idea, too. Yeah. If you if you're just dead set on this feature, this is going to be the greatest feature ever. And you are behind it 100 percent but you don't have fifty thousand um, dollars then a reasonable path would be to make a short based on that feature a single scene or something prequel whatever generate that kind of excitement and enthusiasm once you've made the short and then use that to make it a feature yeah, yeah. And it's even i mean it's, it is a bit of a long shot but i have heard stories where somebody had a short and they just happened to pitch it to an actor, like a famous actor. Um, and they were like, yeah, sure, I'll do a cameo in there for 10000 <laughs> you know what I mean? Or $20,000 or something like that. And, you know, if somebody has that money or whatever, even that can definitely go a long way. It's kind of ridiculous to say it, but, you know, star power. Yeah, I think it works. And I think that works better in terms of selling the actor in the first place is if, if you've got like a four or five minute short to show as opposed to a script kind of right you and know, then obviously the they love a good script but let's just be honest a film is always going to be more accessible so if you yeah. if you want to really pursue the feature i would still recommend do a short but do a short to show your idea you know to get get get, get across visually what you're trying to say so that you can show them no no i want to i want to do this whole world and i've got all these characters and this is going to be amazing here's three minutes of that just to give you an idea of what i'm trying to do right yeah it's a trust thing exactly. it really is because they don't want to be in something that's going to make them look bad right well they especially see that you're you can actually do what you're what you yeah say. so wes i want to ask you about uh um you you've been around in the in the baltimore film scene for 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 a while now and um what where are some of the first off i guess it's two questions what what's the what is the baltimore film scene like independent film scene like how vibrant is it and then also have you noticed it um just in general, um, independent filmmakers kind of becoming more, or are there more independent filmmakers now than when you started? I guess is, is the other question. Um, okay, so the Baltimore filmmaking community is definitely very vibrant. Uh, there are a lot of people out there making films. Um, now, I, I, like I said before, the, the problem, well, I don't want to say the problem, that's the problem. The reality is, is that they're usually they're very individual they're small groups that are very independent of each other you know there's not really much of a community in the sense of like everyone coming together to make films uh, most groups are individually doing their own things um in terms of the latter question absolutely um there are a lot more people making films um part of that just feels like there's more money in baltimore being made towards films and part of it is just it's it's getting every year it's, it's getting it's getting easier and easier to make films at least in terms of like um the technical skills the the equipment necessary all of that just gets cheaper and cheaper every year so um yeah i would say that there's a lot more people making film absolutely yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's definitely in our our observation as well. You know, definitely you see you're seeing a lot more stuff kind of appearing online and just more people making it. And uh, yeah, it's just interesting. But it's like there is a shortage of, you know, while it's easier to make stuff, it's still you know there's still that learning curve, and it's still like you can't just jump in making a good movie. You have to learn how to make it. And, yeah, yeah, and there's a difference too between a high quality looking movie and like a great movie because of the story. Right. And that's really one of the hardest things to do. So I guess like in, you know, in, so in this process too, like of uh, pre-planning and everything, and even during production and post, like, I mean, does the script really change all that much? You think, have you noticed that? Or is this something uh, that's kind of static? It, okay. Obviously that varies from writer to writer. Um, <clears throat> I am personally always trying to encourage 
um, people to continue to work on their scripts. I am very much a big believer in the idea that a great script is not written as it is polished into being, you know, that you start with an okay script and then you make it better and better and better. Um, <clears throat> one of the things though about making your own film, and this is intentional, but one of the things about making your own film is that you are the sole, you know, arbiter of what goes in the script or not. And so for a lot of people, especially for the people who are not necessarily strong writer backgrounds, more director, filmmaker back, or at least more interested in that, the, the writing is so laborious, so labor intensive that once they get that first draft, they're like, oh, thank God. <laughs> and they don't do much changing with it. Um, for others, especially for the more ones with the stronger writing background, they are coming in, they're writing a script, then they revise it, then they change it, and then revise it. And those revisions can happen all the way up to and including the day of the shoot itself. Um, having said that, though, that feels like one of those things that is learned more by returning directors than by first-time directors. Uh, first-time directors are just so nervous about their first piece and about learning all this new information and just trying to coordinate the logistics of making a film that once that first draft is finished, they spend most of the rest of the time worrying about pre-production, production, so on and so forth. Yeah. Having said that, returning directors, people who get a little bit more experience, people who are making their second or their third film, they're much more uh, conscious about re-editing the script and yeah. even making ch uh, changes in the um, edit itself once the film itself actually is uh, filmed. So I think that's one of those things that doesn't necessarily happen right away for most people, but is something they pick up as they become more comfortable with the process in general. Yeah, no, that's definitely, and it's an important kind of skill to learn. It's, it's really weird. It's like, I mean, I've met some people who are very defensive about changes and whatnot. Um, and that would kind of hurt the cinematographer and, and people who are helping like with just logistical planning, but also with the actors too, because maybe the lines aren't coming out the way, it, it just doesn't sound right when they say it, as opposed to just reading it and stuff. You know, I for, I know that for a lot of people, especially if you know, they've had this, this idea that they've been working on for a long time, people who have this, this story that they need to tell, they they they're very some of them are, are reluctant to make any changes at all because it's their precious baby and they don't want to make any changes um but most directors eventually come around to this idea to understand that everybody is there to try to help and actors in particular are a great resource because they're the only ones who are really going to be looking at the script from a unique perspective from that character's perspective as the writer you're looking at the whole piece you're you're very big picture which is the your job that you're supposed to be a big picture but only this actor is going to be looking at the entire piece from like phil's perspective and just looking at it from phil and so they say look i don't know this line doesn't really feel like it works for this character that i think there should be extra weight given to that as the director to go, okay, yeah, I see, okay, right, you, you see Phil's more like this, okay, I can kind of work with that. Um, again, the central tenet of the group is your story, you tell your story your way, so if you're like, that's how it is, that's how it is. Um, but yeah, I do think with experience comes um, maybe a little bit more confidence in what you're trying to do and a little bit more acceptance of new ideas that are not going to ruin your piece, but in fact would actually add and enhance your piece. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But it's a lot of that comes with time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, like, um, so what about if a script is too expensive for you to shoot? I mean, I know obviously if somebody gives you a 30 page script, that's just inherently going to be too expensive to shoot, but let's say they give you something that's like a 15 pager or something where it's like, yeah, it's doable, but there's like, all these other things in there that make it expensive like what are some of those common things that you see that just you know cause the budget to just skyrocket okay well <clears throat> so first let me say that for people who, who come into the charm city film um you are expected to pay for everything you are the producer uh now like as i said we'll get you the cast the crew the locations most of the components of the piece we've got props that you can borrow etc cetera, etc cetera. we can make a film for basically nothing you know just craft services and insurance but 
you want everyone to have brand new toys. You want co special costumes. You want to you want to rent a particular location. Uh, that's on you. So you have to pay for it. So it's not so much a matter of like this is too expensive. Um, but having said that, there are some things that make the cost go way way up. Um, I will say that some of the films we've done before, like some of the most expensive things, have involved. Uh, either very particular locations. We've had locations that have cost several hundred dollars. Um, honestly, the most expensive stuff that we've had in the past is that people will bring in outside experts, dance groups, um, hired gun cinematographers, that kind of thing. Uh, and that can add a ton of money. Uh, they they want to they, they hire somebody to write all their music at the end. That adds another $1,000. Um, if you are willing to spend all of that money, you are completely well allowed to do that. We had a short, um, this past wave that was, uh, $30,000. She was willing to pay that money. So we did it. Um, but I would say this is just sort of general advice for anyone making a film. Um, most, most of the real expenses money wise comes when people don't they forget about something, they don't plan something, and then they have to sort of handle it at the last minute. You know what I mean? And so I find that most of the time, most of the money being spent on the production is usually being spent on the shoot, you know, on the day of the shoot or like the week before the shoot because they have to rush in some prop from somewhere or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, even if you have money, you still want to work to great lengths to make your production as cheap as humanly possible. Like I said, when we first started, we were making films for like five, $6,000 and that's all well and good. But you, if the plan is to, and this is the recommendation is to make a film and then make another film and then make another film. So you're getting better and better, the cheaper, more efficiently you can do. So the more often you can practice, if you want to tell stories then you need to figure out a way to tell them as cheaply as possible so that you can tell lots of stories. I'm not saying everything has to be made out of paper mache, but I am saying that if you are, and I've seen this, I've had first time directors going, I've got several thousand dollars saved up. I want to make a film. I'm throwing it all at it. And that's like, great. Okay. You've now made one film. Right. You could have spent that same, that same money and been more effective and cost effective and made five films kind of thing. Uh, so always look for ways to reduce the cost of your budget. Yeah, definitely. I think you just described us pretty well. Uh, <laughs> it was just, I, look, I, I get it, we but were... the problem is, I like I said, I see it as a missed opportunity to make more films. Yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely see that in hindsight now, for sure. Um, but, yeah, yeah, you know. Somebody like, comes to me and said, I want to spend, you know, I want to spend a ridiculous amount of money on the film. I'm like, okay, I mean, you want to. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to say no to that. Yeah, of course not. Of yeah. Course yeah. Not. yeah, you just say, you know, just throw me some. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, in my experience, uh, like, some, th some things that do really drive up the cost that people don't think about is, like, government buildings versus privately owned buildings mm. so like a government building you know a lot of states they'll let you shoot there for free the only problem is they require production insurance and you know liability insurance and stuff like that and that could end up costing like fifteen hundred dollars or twelve hundred dollars depending on you know uh, one, one of the big things we've, we've done relatively recently is gotten a group policy for insurance uh, which means that individual directors only actually have to pay $100 for their insurance. But you're right. It makes a big difference now because we're now talking about getting permits. We're now talking about um, um, getting locations we would never be able to get before because we're getting insurance. That insurance lets us get a permit. You'd be surprised. I mean, I, you know, another great resource out there, uh, the Baltimore Filmmakers Office, I do want to give them a shout out, has been really helpful in the past year or so in terms of hooking us up with permits, helping us get access to things that we would never have been able to get access to before. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what exactly how you're going to film, there are, in fact, a lot of groups and resources out there that can help you film. Um, if you're serious about making a film, I would tell anybody, find out what kind of resources and assistance is out there. There are people who will help you make your film or they at least help you make it cheaper than you would have otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Look, in, in any, every city, major city at least, has a film office. Or mm -hmm. And that's, that's all they do. <laughs> they just exactly. sit there and make it easier to make films. So like, right. 
And Good they deal. Working with independent people, and you know, and a lot of cities have groups just like Charm City. You know, uh, meetup groups that, where the purpose is to make movies together. So um, definitely, highly recommend checking those out in your city. Yeah, and alternatively too, you could, you know, if you have to go private, I mean, a lot of time, I would say honestly, try to go private as often as you can because you just have more like leeway there especially if it's, you know, uh, a very mom and pop kind of establishment. If you're doing something like the Mets stadium or something like that, right. it's like, okay, yeah, that's going to cost a pretty penny. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of private places where it's like, you wouldn't think you could film there, but all you got to do is just ask them. And a lot of times people are just really excited that, Oh, Hey, cool. My uh, shop or whatever is going to be in this film. So yeah. that's cool. Well, if you keep your crew small enough and you have the, the camera small enough, you can film anywhere. Yeah. 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 well i will say along those lines um just a bit of free advice on that it's been my experience that you get a lot more success with people who are the actual individual owners as opposed to like a chain or something that's corporate if you can find find a mom and pa diner and talk to the actual owner of that diner in most cases they'll be they'll say yes as long as you're willing to film when they're closed most places are perfectly fine with that bigger corporations that usually gets really troublesome that usually ends up being, you know, we'll have to talk to corporate, which is almost always a no. Um, but yeah, if you can find an actual, if you can find an actual individual owner for a location, most of the times they'll say yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For free. I mean, they're like, yeah, sure. Just no problem. Just, you know, we have to have somebody there to watch you. But other than that, you got the place all night. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. No, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 always ask. That's the best thing. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Honestly, like, like, yeah, actually, most people, a lot of owners are just like, oh, my God, that's so cool. Of course you can film here. It's the coolest yeah. thing ever, you know. And then you show up with, like, 20 guys, and you're moving stuff around. They're like, oh, oh God. God. <laughs> yeah. And then they realize the mistake. What, what were we doing? <laughs> never again. Yeah. yeah. that uh, Well, that happened to us when we were shooting at a warehouse, and it was just this magnificently huge structure straight out of, like, Batman movie. And, you know, he was totally cool letting us use it for free. But, man, he called us up afterwards and was like, hey, you just spiked my power bill. And, <laughs> and like, yeah. you're going to have to pay for that. <laughs> like, but, weird. yeah, well, it's also kind of hard, too, with uh, prop guns on streets. That's something where if you're going to be out on the street with, like, 15 people and you're having guns in there. Oh, yeah. You're probably going to have to. Obviously, you're going to have to talk to the police and, you know, he's got to be smart. About and it, you yeah. probably have to actually get a cop out there. Um, but, you know, yeah. all of that's not crazy expensive. Getting a permit, yeah. getting an officer for a few hours. All of that is doable. I, yeah, you know, like I said, one of the biggest for people who first come in the group, it's always one of the two ways. Either they want to do everything and they can they want to make a feature and they assume it's super easy or they assume everything is ridiculously hard. And part of what I like to do with the group is like, you know, understand that there are things that they can do that they could like, yeah, you can, you want to, you know, you want to rent a, a police car, the Baltimore filmmaker office will give you one for 65 bucks. Like it's, it's, it's surprising how much, how much easier some things are. Some things are really, really difficult. Absolutely. But I think for most people, when they first get started, they don't realize how much is actually available to them for either nothing or for very little. Yeah. Like, for instance, in Alabama, the cops will let you use their guns in their films, like real live ammunition and all. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so I guess, yeah, just to kind of wrap this up, um, mm -hmm. we didn't really talk about production day itself. Um, could you maybe like maybe touch a little bit on like what is that big basic operation like from start to finish? Okay. Well, assuming everything is sort of locked in, and obviously it varies from uh, shoot to shoot, but more or less, you know, you assemble your crew. Uh, the cast will come in usually in like an hour later kind of thing. Um, a lot of shoots are all, you know, outdoor day shoots. So they might be like 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. We've also done all night shoots, 7 p.m. <laughs> to 7 a.m., and other things depending that are independent of the day. But generally, a shoot day is 12 hours. So the crew assembles in the morning. Director's got to be their first thing, of course. Uh, equipment gets set up, uh, casket into makeup and costume, and then we start filming. Usually it's about two hours or so in, two to three hours, depending on the shoot. Um, I will say that probably the most time-consuming element on shoot 
is moving camera and lights that that usually takes more time than anything else so one of the things your first ad will do with you before the shoot is sit there and talk about like an order of shooting things that makes the most sense that has the the least camera movement uh so that you can move through your day as quick as possible uh then there's several hours of shooting hopefully uh, there's always a mid-break uh, meal if we're shooting all night, then we're eating at you know midnight. If we're shooting all day, then it's a lunch meal. There's always, always required um, a mid-lunch meal because the cast and crew need the break. Uh, and then more shooting in the afternoon, wrapping at the end, loading in, loading out, that kind of thing. Um, one of the most time-consuming elements also is uh, locations. So you, generally speaking, first time directors, one day shoots is usually one location, sometimes two locations, but anything over that starts to become, uh, well, a time crunch problem. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's always important to keep keep it simple means one location, ideally one room. <laughs> so you don't have to move yeah. too much. And sometimes you may run out of time too, where it's like, okay, you're at the, you know, two hour mark before you hit 12 hours or whatever, and you got to get through all these shots. So you're just gonna have to figure out what limbs you're going to chop. And yeah, I mean, you might have to do it a little bit more simply, you know what I mean? Instead of getting all of those shots that you wanted, yeah. you're just gonna have to figure out the priority shots to be able to tell the story. Well, that's when you're in trouble, I think. Yeah, I think, I think sometimes figure that out in pre-production. Yeah. <laughs> if you're doing that, if you're cutting on set, you're cutting out stuff, as you're, then you're in trouble. Yeah. Well, look, the reality is, is that, you know, a battle plan only lasts until you go into battle. Exactly. Um, yeah. It is true that um, every shoot I've ever been on has required things to shift around, you know, that you plan for a particular thing and things have to change. Part of being a director is being flexible on set. Um, I do think that one of the best pieces of advice you can keep in mind as you're filming, especially if you're running into a crunch at the end, is just remember the story you're trying to tell. And if that means you have to cut this and this so the story gets told, that's what you have to do. Um, the, that's always got to be your first priority, telling a story. Yeah. If you spend the whole day there and you don't manage to tell your critical point, you don't get to the climax scene or whatever, uh, then in a lot of ways you've wasted the day. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it's like, yeah, it's kind of like being out in space without a spacesuit. You could survive for 30 seconds, but you're also kind of dying quickly. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> try not to do that, but you can do it and maybe you'll lose a hand or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I guess, uh, do you have any like final thoughts? Maybe like, uh, like your one number one piece of advice that you could really just give to any writer looking to make their first short film? Make it look. The, the thing is, it's. I believe it's much better to make a poorly made film and learn from it than to just sit there in script phase forever. Take a camera, pick it up, film it, and that doesn't have to be by yourself. There are so many people out there that um, know a lot about filming who'd be willing to help. If nothing else, you could pick their brain and get advice and suggestions on them. Even if you're all by yourself doing your thing, there are people out there who can and will help find them, use those resources. Um, filmmaking does not, you don't have to start from scratch. Yeah, yeah, That's absolutely, true. man. Yeah, in this day and age, there's so many resources out there. It's There's no excuse. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just being online for the past 10 years, like, it's surprising to be able to, like, get in contact with this, like, you know, famous writer or something like that, or this guy who owns this, like, really popular company or whatever. They're not you know, people aren't really as inaccessible as you think, especially people who are just starting out. So like a good thing to do is just go on Facebook, go on meetup and whatnot. I think that's how we found Charm City Filmmakers. Uh, you had a meetup ad or whatever. And yeah, I mean, we just got it. Um, yeah. Oops, Everyone who's ever made a film, every filmmaker and writer, director, famous or not, they all had to start from somewhere too. And they remember how hard it was. And they're always looking, at, I mean, that's that's a big part of why I do it. Um, when I first got started, there wasn't a lot of help and support out there. And, you know, my goal is to actually get that, is to let that support be out there for people who are getting started now. Wow. 
that's well we're glad you uh live in our neck of the woods because yeah, yeah i mean you've i mean you and the charm city group has just been super helpful for us and our development um as filmmakers uh but yeah, man, like we really appreciate you coming out uh, for a second podcast. I mean, this is a really wonderful conversation. And I personally, I mean, I think we got a, a wealth of information uh, for so. our viewers. So we really appreciate that, man. Yeah. And always, always glad to help. Yeah, man. And thank you, everyone, for checking this out. Uh, but Wes, real quick, uh, where can people find Charm City Filmmakers if they want to learn more about the organization? Maybe join in on some of the online workshops that you host. Best place to get started, charmcityfilmmakers.com. All right, cool. Cool. Put that in the show notes. But awesome, Wes. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, until next time. Anytime, gentlemen. Anytime. <laughs> we'll see you on the set, man. Absolutely. Okay. All right.